Joining us on this episode is Katie Levine. Katie is a fashion and portrait photographer based in Phoenix, Arizona. Beginning her career working as an intern for Vogue, following up with an internship with Annie Leibovitz, jumping between New York and Los Angeles, working with celebrities like Kourtney Kardashian and Marisa Tomei, she's created an incredible high-end business built around her professionalism and respect in the industry. Focusing now on pivoting away from celebrity work to craft a life that brings her joy in her work and her relationship. I'm Kyle Wilson, and this is The Photographer's Problem. You know, I feel like I know you and I know your world, but I don't really know exactly like everything that you're actually, I don't really know how you pay your bills, and, like what you photograph <laughs> and what actually like, for me, it's clear and simple. It's like, I work for narrative and I shoot weddings and you know, that's what the income comes in. But like, I really don't know everything that you do. I kept a little, I kept little glimpses of it online and I see that you're doing like a magazine cover or you're DPing for a movie, like you just said, or something like that. But what, what's like your full world right now? Like, how do you describe yourself when someone says, oh, you're a photographer? Like, what do you do? Well, a lot of it changed once I moved to Arizona. So I kind of made the decision during the pandemic to shift gears. Like, whereas I was mostly basically strictly doing editorial or lifestyle brands for portraitures, like that's kind of where my world was. It was definitely heavily celebrity based. But once the pandemic hit, my priority shifted. As you know, you're my wedding photographer. I got married and just different things kind of happened in my life. So once I moved to Arizona, I was like, hey, this is like a completely like new environment for me. So thank God during the pandemic, I created a thing called FaceTime shoots where I basically discovered that you can, um, I can take over someone's phone remotely and take over their camera. So I kind of do that now. I do them for companies. I'm doing them for an entire app right now with like some of the biggest plastic surgeons in the country. So like that's one project. Cool. And the FaceTime shoots really kept me afloat until like word got out about me here. And now I'm really like a... And who's who's hiring you for like a FaceTime shoot? Is that the model? Is that an agency? Is that just a standalone person who wants photos? No, they're companies the that have all gone remote. So um, I've done a campaign for Sephora. Like they wanted some like before and afters with um, some people that had used their products. I did a whole campaign with I Am A Voter. Sometimes Make-A-Wish Foundation, like a lot of the kids who are, you know, sick, they can't really get to a photo studio. So it's easy for them to be done in their house. And then entire companies, like I've worked for this company called Merkel. I did like 500 and 50 uh, employees for them. And then now I'm doing a whole app where it's like I'm doing virtual interviews and virtual photos to create a whole app right now. So dang. Yeah. That's like, okay. That's really amazing. Cause I saw you started doing that and I saw a lot of other photographers obviously jump in on the FaceTime shoot thing. And I thought it would be a really cool, I, I never did any of them. Um, and I probably should have, cause it seems like a really fun, like experimental space to play in. But, um, I just assumed it was for agencies and models and just like, Oh you know, no, it's for like that anybody that needs a headshot because most, especially with people yeah. that have gone remote, um, it's like a really great way. Like it takes 10 minutes. You can do it with an iPhone, set up a little ring light in your house and then, you know, bam, you've got a new headshot. So it's really yeah. cool. Um, have you, have you felt any decline in it as COVID has kind of like obviously lifted and people are back in the office or is it now just a steady stream? It picks, it still stays steady. I honestly didn't think I'd be doing it this long. Like someone this morning was like, this is so cool. I can't believe you do this. And I'm like, I really can't believe I'm still doing this. Um, and it's gotten to now where I'm so booked with them that I just have to keep pricing them up and up because I'm so booked with them. So it's 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 not slowing down. It's definitely staying still. Yeah, like I said, it's taken on kind of a whole world of its own. Awesome. Yeah, that's awesome. And so just to help a stupid person like me out, so the other person, they're getting photographed from their, obviously, their device's end on the phone. And are you like giving out, has this, turned into like a, you have like a prep kit where you're like, Hey, here's what you're going to need. You're getting this like a nicely lit room. You're going to need a ring light. You're going to need this kind of gear. Exactly. Like, so I said not like not PDF too? and then, um, you know, it's pretty standard, you know, we do the like, okay, shoulder forward, arms crossed, hands on the face. Like it's definitely, um, pretty there. But I, what I noticed is just my personality is kind of what makes <coughs> me feel comfortable and that's what gets the good results, you know? So yeah, pretty cool. Has there been, do, do you feel that there's stuff, not only limitations, but also stuff that you can do on a FaceTime shoot, like with certain kinds of people that you wouldn't be able to get in a real life shoot. Like, are you able to like, do you, do you think people will get more comfortable because they're like, Oh, she's not here. I can like break past some nervousness. Definitely. Like I think still the ultimate way to book with me is I'm sure you'd feel the same way as like in person. There's just that connection that yeah, you can't cool. really, um, you know, you can get it a little bit through virtual, uh, but I don't yeah. know. And then sometimes I'm like, I think I'm actually coaching people more on FaceTime than I do in person. Because there's so oh, many wow, other okay. factors, you know, like when you're obviously yeah. there's lighting and there's this. And so sometimes I notice yeah. I'm getting a little too distracted on making the lighting perfect in person. Mm. I'm less helping with posing. So when it's this, it is really like I'm there to just like help them get a great headshot. It's pretty standard. Um, 
So whereas, you know, when we do all these other shoots, it's lots of different things. Yeah. So what are your in real life shoots? What do you, what do you have going on lately with that? Like when you're, cause I, cause I see you, I catch glimpses of it, which is kind of my favorite version of seeing photographers online is rather than being fed every single thing that you ever produce every Monday through Friday, I get little snippets of your world. I'm like, I don't know what she's got going on, but it seems busy. But I like it. That's how I feel with you too. I'm like, <laughs> where, where's he up to? Um, and I love your uh, personal work you do too, which I think is so in contrast to the wedding. You know what I mean? So I always love seeing that kind of uh, contrast with you as someone that's a fan of your work. But yeah, so my new thing is I'm kind of trying to like, I did that celebrity world for so long and now I'm, how do I make every, like every business owner, every, even a realtor, how do I make people feel like the star? So instead of photographing celebrities, mostly I'm like, how can I bring that star power to everybody else? So I've created this mm. thing called like elevate your brand with Katie Levine. And it's like branding shoots that gives people content for months because social media is really like, I think of the biggest thing with photographers is you have to stay current with the times and now everybody's yeah, a celebrity, yeah, right? Yeah, you can only be like 90 days in advance at a time. Exactly. And so, yeah, since everybody is now their own personal brand, it's branding shoots is kind of like my bread and butter now as well. That's awesome. Man, that's so cool. Because I feel like when – I don't even know how it started, but like when we met, it was – you had – I was really looking up to you because you had day rates, which to me was like super foreign. I went, oh, I photograph weddings, but like – this photographer has a day rate for like a corporate shoot. I, that's like some professional adult stuff. And so now to just see how that's like formulated, because I've always been, it's very unfamiliar to me. It's a, uh, like, we've talked about this a lot in the past about how there are agencies that might want agent work or not agent work, but work like the, like my personal work that I produce, but I've personally never been able to like bridge that gap or even make the attempt to go, oh, this is the stuff I shoot that has no rules or boundaries. Like who might want to use that and buy it? And how do you price been, for you know, that? Like, like yeah how do, you, for how do you price for it yeah who the heck wants it how do you depend on paying your rent for it and i feel like you've from the get-go like right from when i met you you took that lane when i went weddings you took a lane that said i'm gonna do something that's so unfamiliar to me uh me personally and expanded that into a way that obviously you're like you're paying a mortgage now and you had a wedding and your whole life exists because you want to get photographed by katie levine yeah, dude. And like, and that's the thing is too, is that's like now maybe when I first started, you know, I was having like two grand months here and there. And then maybe like one month I'd make like $500. Like it definitely was always like that. But now I'm having like consistent eight to $10,000 months, you know, where it's like, it's, you know what I'm saying? And it picks up in a way that's, um, yeah, like it, I obviously think when you're a photographer, it takes time to kind of build that. And there's months of, you know, figuring it out. Um, but like, you know, you, you kind of just make it work. I think to be a photographer, you have to be a hustler. Yeah. Like if you saw yeah, my you gotta be hustling. Goals, you gotta like, it's, <laughs> it's hustling and a bit of winging it. Like I, I, I tell people as a wedding photographer, I'm a professional wing eater. Like my job is to show up and like, I haven't look at, like, we've talked about this. I haven't location scouted. I don't like doing it. I just want to show up and like be inspired for whatever the place looks like. And I'm following like, where's the light? Where are the lines? You know, all those types of things. But in every aspect of my business, it's a lot of like, I'm just winging it. I'm hoping for the best. And thankfully, like years of experience in both of our lanes, like I'm sure your first handful of FaceTime shoots were like, I'm winging this thing for sure. Rocky. <laughs> yeah. And now you feel like probably concrete, right? Oh, yeah. And it's so cool, though, even like seeing you at my wedding, like, because obviously I was I had ideas of what I thought I wanted. And then just seeing how like, even you switching from one location where like where our actual family photos were like they were so beautiful and it just like everybody's got this whole you know you have obviously a completely different vision than mine but like seeing how you viewed things was so cool at my wedding like it was remarkable like you captured just especially the intimate portraits of me and my husband like yeah it made me have a whole new respect for you and like I think oh wedding parties, there's a reason I don't do it all the time I think it's yeah. very difficult <laughs> I love, love, love the, there's like a handful, four or five photos of Dylan that are so, he looks so cool in them. He's just got his hair full back and he's like messing yeah. with his wrist or something like that. And they look, if I was him, I'd be so stoked to have those. They just, he oh, just he looks loves them. really, really cool and handsome. Um, I, I view a day on like a wedding day kind of like, feels like very segmented chapters. And so it's like, I have an idea I'm trying to get to. I kind of work on getting to it. Once I like climb up to that plateau, I'll play around there for a second. And then I kind of abandon it. And I'm like, I'm done. And on to the next thing. And that, that happens in a lot of shoots. Do you, do you, if you were to like try to draw out like how your, uh, a shoot might go for you, do you have an idea in mind that you're trying to get to? And then you get there and you abandon that whole concept and move to the next thing. Or do you keep a steady flow between? I think there's like, you can only be as prepared as like, you know, whatever, like even for this shoot, I'm just shooting a cover of Playgirl next week. 
and I'm location scouting on Friday, you know, just virtually and whatever, but like the light is not going to be the same that day. And, um, you know, it's just all these different factors. Sorry, I'm hiccuping. Um, but yeah, like I said, I have a plan in place, but at the end of the day, the experience kind of overrules plans, in my opinion, like my experience, like I could go into something completely blind and feel confident that I could achieve anything in that room, you know, um, based on experience, not on preparation. So I think that just comes with like, as you know, the more you shoot, the better you get. It's true. Yep. I 1000% agree with that. I actually find myself more like I'm, a, I'm annoyed when someone says, Hey, do you want to go check this location prior or look at it? Not really. I really, it, it's, it's not going to do anything for me i would much rather like my ability my confidence and my ability to execute within three seconds of seeing it with my eyeballs is way more than if i like get there the day ahead and start looking around and come up with ideas in advance most of the ideas in advance i come up with i feel like turn out to be stupid because the client and i are not organically falling in that direction and i just talked about this in a, a video i posted for narrative where a, it's the language of weddings. It's something that you just like start to learn and pick up over time. You can feel that you, you just know how a day is going to go. And B, it's just this, maybe the client's going to look dumb. Like I try to put them over there and it looks stupid. So I'd rather, I find more of those occasions if I plan too much. I'm actually just better at winging it, which kind of might be my, it might be like my built-in laziness. Like I'm, I've become, so I'm way better just being prepared in the moment than I am like leading up to it. <laughs> Well, and I also think like just faking it a little bit, like, you know, I've definitely had times where maybe I didn't say like, oh, hey, this looks stupid, but I was like, okay, in my mind, I'm like, this looks really bad. I was like, we're just gonna, <laughs> oh, hey, we got that shot. And then the clients really don't even remember taking those photos. So I think it's like how you handle those moments and like the trust and the relationship that you create with your clients, like kind of like, okay, hey, yeah, we tried this, not 100%, let's move on. And knowing when to be like decisive enough to move on is really key for any photographer. Like if you had just stayed in that like, you know, stupid position and you took like 10 minutes of someone's wedding, like those 10 minutes are precious. So like being really decisive and be like, hey, this doesn't work. Let's. Yeah, you know. we had something on your day by the lake. I can't remember what it was, but we, I shot for maybe a frame or two and I went, no, nah, that's dumb. Let's go. And I was yeah. done. I was at, like, I'm over it. I can't be convinced otherwise. And we're moving on to the next spot. And that's just kind of how I am on any kind of a shoot. As soon as I'm over it, and I've got a friend who referenced that too. She goes, you have a real like, bye. <laughs> I'm done. I'm over it. <laughs> yeah. I want to move along. Well, um, but I think that's like the difference between good and great, right? Is that decision yeah. making. What do you think in your current business or creativity or anything that is like elevating your baseline of good? Like it's something we've been talking about with work a lot with like AI making its way into culling and editing and so on. And all that's really going to do is it's going to say, okay, well, I don't have to spend as much time over here. My baseline of good has been risen. I can go focus somewhere else. Is there things in your world right now that you're like, oh, this is elevating my baseline of good? So, I mean, I, like, especially with AI, that's just obviously like a whole other topic, right? But like, I'm, I don't like, people said the other day, they're like, do you think AI is going to take over photography? And I was like, absolutely not. Like, it's not, it's, it can only enhance it. Like I did some senior pictures the other day and they, I, the mom had sent me these like, you know, inspo pictures where there was clouds and it was not a cloudy day. So I just said, Hey, AI, add some clouds in there. And like, it looks so much better. And um, so certain things like that, um, I think, can be to your advantage. It's just like when I started, I started as a film photographer and I was very anti Photoshop and all that led me to be is not com like not a competitor. So I think you've got to just stay consistent, but also like knowing um, like I don't retouch anymore, like very rarely unless someone's like paying me specifically for my retouching skills. I send it out because I don't have time for it. And it's just not a good use of my resources. Right. I'd rather spend time shooting. So um, I haven't used Imogen or anything like that yet for my batching or anything like that. But that's just because I'm like an al dente person. I feel like my edits need that little, just a little, little touch, of yeah. me. Yeah, exactly. Um, but I'm trying to think of like anything that makes me go from good to bad. I think it's just my personality. Like that's truly it. Um, I know that that is what makes me different as a photographer, my understanding, my patience, um, my kindness, my ability to like, I'm really good at telling if somebody like I've had so many times where people have broken down like in tears in front of me because I felt so like self-conscious or so uncomfortable and I've been able to like flip that into like getting one of their favorite photos of themselves so I think that ability just to like relate to people is so key especially with um 
it's what it's the difference. Like I know that people a hire me because I use the best quality gear. I use pro photo. You know what I'm saying? Like I, there's that aspect of me, but there's also like you pay half of what you're paying me is for my gear and half of what you're paying for is my personality. Yeah. And I think that like rings true a lot. It's funny. I've, I've shot with a few different wedding photographers um, and just seen their personalities really exude through one of which I'll totally publicly know. Her name is Jess Hunter and she's such a beautiful wedding photographer, but she's really uh, sweet and somber and really quiet. She kind of whispers behind her camera. And for me, the idea of if I were to just be suddenly quiet all day and not like you and I are very similar in that way, we're, we're really loud and extroverted. And I think that that generates what kind of work we end up photographing. But if I were to be really quiet, it would, I don't even know how to operate that day, but it's because she's leaned into that and her clients have really sought that of her. Just like your clients are seeking it of you. Like they're like, Hey, we know from the very first phone call with Katie, really even before that, from the first story we saw or Instagram reel or something, that this is what we're walking into. And we know that that's the thing we want to order. And that's the thing that's going to get us these images that we want is how you are on a shoot with people. Well, and that's the thing is it you know, if you think about clients needs, right, it's all a pie and we can all have a slice of it. Like even that photographer that's more silent, it probably means that like on her day, maybe her, her like clients want somebody that's more just in the background, respecting their time. You know what I'm saying? Is just catching these little like intimate moments. And like, that's not me. Like I'm not, you know what I'm saying? So there's, that's why in the pie of photography, everybody's got a piece, right? So yeah. Yeah, I think on a wedding day, it's like I'm I'm pretty I'm pretty passive for most of the day. Like I just really want to like observe as things go on, and I'll jump in when necessary. I'll be like, oh, I need to be assertive right now because the light isn't what I need, or somebody's in my way, or something like that. But it's this really chill, passive vibe. And sometimes there's been a couple wedding days in the past where maybe my energy isn't there. I, I have something going on in my real life, and the videographer that particular day is really assertive, and I'm like, you know what? Sure, you do that. You do it, man. You call the shots. You're in charge. I'm good with that. I'm gonna I'm gonna lay back, but. For most of the time, that's yeah, a really hard balance too. Is the videographer photographer like it's yeah. a whole relationship too? Yeah, I feel like it's getting even more uh, interesting because I haven't had one yet, but I hear about content creators as a new vendor that's kind of making their way into the play, and I'm interested to see how passive those people are versus how active they're going to be in like demanding time or carving out things that they want to get as well, which is totally fine. Um, but there, it's another level of like, and I've said this for a while that I think photography is the entree and videography is the side dish. And it's always going to be the case. That's just what it is. It might be for the moment really exciting, but you're not going to really look at the video in five years. You're looking at the photos and it'll be interesting to see like a content creator come in and be like, Hey, I need to carve out time now and have their little egos thrown around as well. Well, and I think that's also the thing too, is when you have egos, um, it affects your client. You know what I mean? Like if you're gonna, like you, even if a, like a videographer was a dick to me, I'd be like, okay, that's cool. But like, how can we communicate and get like the best results? Because I'm still going to do my thing and you have to do your thing. So like, what relationship can we have that it feels like we're communicating and respectful to one another? Yeah. And like, yeah. I think something I've always approached and it might, it's probably totally an ego thing, but like on a wedding day, I want everybody to be a teammate. I go in really open-minded. We're all on the same team. As long as we all know that at the end of the day, I am actually the final word. <laughs> and as soon as that gets pushed back upon, then I have to like, then I bring my ego into it. I go, well, no, no, no. Like, all right, I will be the boss now. That's fine. We could, we could have all been chill, but, um, but I think it's because like, I know that in six weeks I have to deliver photos. Every, the cake has been eaten. The DJ has been played. The venue has been closed. Like I've got to deliver a thing in a few weeks. So I have something to answer for. And it's a totally different pressure than, I don't know, content creators who are going to be making something to like get posted that day, that week. And then it's kind of going to be gone. Exactly. But exactly. Um, so as you've been going through, obviously, like really totally different lanes of your career from celebrity to FaceTime shoes, now brands along the way, like what's been the proudest moment of your career? Um, I really loved working for Annie Leibovitz. I interned for Annie Leibovitz and that was like, I mean, as a 22 year old who that was like her dream come true. That was for like, like a year, right? Out. For a while. Yeah. And it was really cool because I started as just like a production intern and I ended up like volunteering to drive on set and to just basically do anything to be on set. Like I was so desperate to be there. And as a production intern, you don't necessarily go on set unless they hire you as like an actual production assistant for the set day. So I really offered to do anything and it was really transformative. And then I ended up being like asked to be on the photo team. And I was one of the first girls on our photo team in like a decade. So it was really, that was like 
you know, I mean, a complete dream. Like every other week we're like, we were doing a Louis Vuitton ad, then a Vogue, like a Vogue cover shoot. And like, it was so intense. Like I did some of the craziest things in my life. Like one time we did a shoot on the, like a construction site of like the 77th floor in New York, which had no windows. Like just insane shit. Dude. Yeah. I like, remember you I, telling I me a story about like carrying a generator up a mountain or something like that. And just like all, oh, the, yeah. all the bonkers environments you got thrown into from like, knowing nothing about the scale well just uh, w w how big is her team like what's the size of her like production team from in-house to, uh, so to for a cover shoot there ends up being like 40 to 60 people there okay. and that's when like i realized it takes like you know all the things we flipped through really takes an army to create something that beautiful like the styling team has three assistants the makeup artist you know what i mean it's a huge thing so yeah it was yeah definitely like one of the highlights just because it pushed me so far like um both my internship i interned at vogue and annie's and both of them like pushed me further than i ever thought was possible which is also very humbling yeah yeah it's, a, it's an incredible like at 22 what a what a crazy experience to dive into in the career it, it obviously shows now in your current work and your current career uh as you've been building things what's been what's been your worst business decision what's been the thing that you're like uh oh I probably shouldn't have done that. If I could go back in time, I'd probably change that around. <laughs> I've got a whole slew of them. Um, <laughs> no, I, honestly, like I've paid people that I shouldn't have paid for things. Like I remember I hired this, like a girl that used to be my bestie. I had like a PR agency and they charged me two grand for me to basically take pictures of their clients for free. Like it was a complete shit show and it was a really bad decision and it was a bad business move and it hurt me at the time. Um, that's one for sure. Um, hiring your friends is like, it sounds like a really cute idea, but it's really hard. Um, I, Adriana, you know, she was like my studio manager and that's like a situation where it worked out really well, but, um, yeah, it's not always like that. And yeah, I mean, I trusted the wrong people. I gave too much sometimes I, uh, handled, I, I overburdened myself a lot of times by not scheduling myself properly, which then has caused me when I was like 25, I'd definitely be like, stop asking me for the photos. Like you don't understand. Like I'm really stressed out right now. Like, and it's not my client's problem that I didn't time manage myself, you know, which I think a lot of people, Oh, my light died. <laughs> um, you know, which a lot of people can relate to, you know? Yeah. I feel like, I mean, we, we had, it was kind of, I can't remember what year it was, but we had that like one issue on a shoot where there was like a miscommunication around, uh, yeah, dude, and the dude didn't want to pay you. People, properly, vendor, yeah, like, all, all that jazz. Yeah. And I remember in that moment, I was thinking, oh, wow, Katie's so good at being, <clears throat> excuse me, you're not only the like lead shoot on this particular day with a day rate and whatnot, but you're also so good at being like, I'm a professional. I need everyone else around me to be at that same level of professionality. And I think that is where I run into issues with not other vendors, but with other teammates or people I've tr entrusted. I'm like, oh, that's a friend. That's a person. That's a colleague. Oh, they, they didn't step up to the level of professionality. I didn't weed them out early enough. And that's usually where like weird, um, clunky decisions and social interactions would come from. And contracts. Like I, I'm not like always the best with contract. Like I'm not going to say that every client gets a contract because it's just not true. Like every FaceTime shoot does not get a contract, you know, like just certain things. Like I know when to do it or not, but I will say what has bitten me in the ass is not having contracts that are like clear and cutthroat, you know? Like for VH1 one time, they were like, oh, we actually need these 25 images retouched by six in the morning and we're finishing the shoot at 11 p.m. You know what I mean? And like that should have been charged. Like I should have gotten overtime. I should have gotten double the, you know what I'm saying? Like there's lots of things that have happened, but, um, you know, or versus like this FaceTime shoot, they hired me, a client hired me for 50 of them. They only did 12 of them and then they just stopped emailing me back. But mm -hmm. because we had a contract in place, like. Yeah. You just paid me like yeah. grands for you know, nothing. I always so. yeah, I always tell people it's like the it's it's of safety like contracts are of safety both for you and the other person. Like it's it's for everyone involved. But yeah, I think like little learning experiences like that, they come up all the time. There's so many weddings I've shot where I was like, Oh, I shouldn't have done that, I shouldn't have communicated that way, I, I should have shot it this way, or oh, I didn't deliver X, Y, or Z. And I think a bunch of like tiny little mistakes are actually kind of good. I actually really think that every photographer should lose images like one time just because it's a good like oh toe God, stubbing experience it. so like okay i've lost images i know what the sensation's like i know what it's like to communicate with the client that this has happened hopefully it's not a bad scenario and now i'm gonna make my system foolproof and i think that like a bunch of tiny mistakes like uh oh i had to stay up till six in the morning editing vhs or vh1 stuff is that's not that's worse things to have happen and now you know and it's like built into your your world i have 
formatted a card though one time before like there's just something like something went wrong and then i had to go on like the formatting like trying to download the things on the internet to get the files i've back uh, and, i've got a i've got a data rescue my- program it saved my butt at least one time for sure it, it'll scar you though. yeah yeah it's it, it sits in my brain for sure like any, anything data related there was one time i showed up to an engagement session thankfully it was local i showed up to an engagement session without a memory card which is so funny now but in that moment in well. that moment oh i was so embarrassed i was like hey i'm so sorry i have to drive 25 minutes back to the studio and back to this place and oh such an embarrassing moment but you know what i never lose a card now i never forget to have a card now yeah no and it's it's actually really nice to hear that like both of us have done the exact same things because you know what it is it's just human error totally. like that's what it is it's human error it's over like you know when any of those type of things happen it's definitely when i've overbooked myself or overwhelmed myself that that's when that happens um because you need to just like and now when i walk out the house i'm like okay memory cards lenses charge batteries like it's like a whole thing and i still have a little bit of that for sure like i will i'm pretty diligent about if i photograph a wedding i get back to the hotel or wherever i'm at i'm i'm gonna dump cards everything's gonna get need where it needs to go but an engagement session might land in the camera bag the camera might the camera bag might land next to the desk and a day or two or three might go by. I'm like, Oh yeah, I should probably get those imported backed up all that stuff. But my brain goes, eh, it's, I know that it's fine. It's fine. But I still, I will still lean into it despite knowing the consequences that come with it for sure. A hundred percent. And I, you know, and the thing is too, is like, you have to match it with your dreams though. When stuff like that happens, like now I'm like, so I just had like a meeting about the movie. I'm going to be a director of photography for everything has to be so organized on like a hyper level. Like even as I'm, you know, cause like, obviously I won't be like holding the camera the whole time. I'll be monitoring. I've got to like take notes. And then at the end of the day, it's like, this is day one, you know, cut of this. It's like the organization for dumping the files on that. It's like on a totally whole other different. level that it's like, if you don't get step one done, then you're not going to, you know? Yeah, that's huge. Um, that being said, as things have been going so well, what's what's been your best business decision? What's been the thing that has really, really rocketed you into the next area? Moving to Arizona. Really? What was so good about moving oh, to Arizona? Yeah. Like going I think it was more that I, it's not really the place of being in Arizona. It was more that I stuck with my gut. Um, I love celebrity stuff. I'm like so grateful I did it, but it really stopped aligning with my morals, just being completely transparent. Um, I'm like a really big, like I've got really big faith in God. I've got really big in faith in myself. And like, I really believe in like treating people properly. It's like always been my thing. Like I just want to make sure people are treated with respect. And so um countless times of me not being treated that way and uh you know yeah it's cool i photographed the kardashians yeah it's cool i did this but like you know it it ultimately left me feeling lonely which you know i could have i definitely saw a path of me being like oh photographing eve saint laurent ads and whatever but it also was probably going to be with me not being married and not having kids and you know not having a dog or like a stable life so um for me moving to arizona was more of like a moral decision and I feel like um, because I went with my gut, I'm really being rewarded. That's amazing. Yeah, because – and correct me if I'm wrong. You were – so you are obviously like Rockford where we were from and then Chicago and then you bounced out to New York or L.A. Then you were like Long Island and then also New York or L.A. and now Arizona. Is there anything – is there another one missing in there? Well, I actually – when I graduated high school, I followed – like a horrible boyfriend to Iowa State. So I did two years at Iowa State. In oh, that's a, forget- this, that's a forget that's a forgettable state. That's why I forgot about it. <laughs> exactly. Um, but you know what it is, is so I actually ended up taking Latin there and um that path actually went ended up helping me while I was interning at Vogue because I had to translate mm. Portuguese one time for one of my bosses and because I knew Latin, you know yeah, what I'm saying? Yeah, so really every helped. step of the journey kind of you know, Iowa to me it could be blown off the map, right? But like I I, it was an, it's still an important step that had, you know, steps in my journey. Yeah. You know? I really hope we get a comment now about like, Hey, I'm from Iowa and I was awesome. <laughs> hey, I yeah, like Iowa too, con- except for a They'll convince me. They'll me. convince me for sure. <laughs> um, are you, are you doing a lot of personal work? Like I, I obviously see like a ton of your actual like real paid client work, but do you have anything that involves a camera that's personal work? Do you, do you go out and just photograph other things or or do you like live that live that to other areas of your life so now it's more like the celebrity stuff is still like kind of my where i get my real like tickles but i'm very like 
adamant about who I'm very particular about who I do it with. And those feel like more like personal times. Like I did a bunch of award show, like I just did pre Grammys, but she's for like this super cool mom TikToker that she's a badass and I really like her, you know? And, um, then I did pre, um, golden globes for, um, Karen Fukurama, who would like to me is just an incredible artist. We're friendly. We've been following each other on Instagram for a long time. So like, I still do celebrity stuff. It's still like flutters me in the same way, but it's definitely, um, yeah, more for that. And then the movie is like a dream yeah. come true for me. So that's going to be more of the personal cool. work, but, um, I'm definitely in the phase of like killing myself for yeah. my job now. That being said, do you, um, do you helpful. carry, do you carry a camera with you? Like on the reg? Like, as it, that's my, my next question is like, what's the camera that you're carrying with you most these days? And I never want it to be like, this is what I'm using for work, but like, what do you, you know me, I'm a little like a dork. So I've got a few laying around, but like, I wish I had a Leica, honestly. Um, that's something I think when I have kids is going to become more like I, I feel like I'm going to have like a Sally Mann phase um, where I'm like, OK, now I'm photographing my family. Um, so that's that's it. But I definitely don't do like just for fun. Like that's definitely not like me carrying a camera around yeah. ever, like which I wish it was. Um, but like when I was in Vietnam, I just did like my 50 millimeter on like a Sony mirrorless. And like that was really um, cathartic for me, like just to have that so like times like that that's what i'll do but yeah my actual cameras i shoot on a canon 1dx and then i have two um sony alpha okay. mirrorless yeah so. i can see i suppose and i like yeah i suppose once you have kids that'll be like the, that'll be i can't see you just like operating completely out of an iphone it may, it would make sense that that would be the pivot to go okay i need to capture this new existence in my life in a way that your talent obviously leans into yeah um i wish though like i think i i don't know about you but i do feel like um yeah, like my job is photography. It's not my hobby. Um, that's what it is. Like, I don't really know how else to say that. Um, I know for a lot of people, it's a, it's a hobby, but for me, it's definitely my career. And so, to be taking more photos and have more editing, um, yeah, feels that's like, the killer. Um, is it's the um, additional tasks. Every button click on a camera is a new task. I'm later me is going to have to do, and later me already doesn't want to do any of it. And so, as I phase out of weddings yeah. to be even less and less. I think the sweet spot now for me is film because it gives me, it matches a bunch, it checks a bunch of boxes. It's it built in inconsistencies, like it's always going to be different. The edit workload on the back end is really, really minimal, if any at all. And I can, and it's kind of a surprise. Like I love sending film off and then getting like a gift back in an email. And I'm like, I don't know what's going to be on this roll. I don't know if it turned out good or not. And now if it wasn't so expensive, that's the killer. It's like the con of is it? It's so expensive to do, but. Yeah, I like that because it doesn't feel like I'm giving myself, like, future self stuff to do. I, honestly, I think that's a really good call. Like, film, and also if any photographer, like, hasn't shot on film, like, to me, you're not actually a photographer because, you know what I mean? You're not, like, using the, you know, comfort of having your digital screen, right? So I think um, just in general, film is, like, the someone, jumping Someone point, said to me, also, I wonder if it was you actually years ago, they were like, if you haven't been in a dark room, you're not a real photographer. And I was like, uh-oh, I have yet to be in a dark room. That was probably 22-year-old Katie being, like, such a little She's like, I haven't any like, leave of it since <laughs> So, like, if you haven't been in a dark room, you're, like, not even a real photographer. <laughs> But I love darkroom. Like uh, in college, it was such a fun class. Like I just remember like we'd be like smoking like on our breaks because your classes for photography are like four hours long. And then we'd come back and like everyone's crawling on the ground, like trying to like mess with each other in the dark room. Like it was a really special memory for me. Like I love doing the dark room and that process. Yeah, it sounds like such a fun thing. And I really actually as I shoot film now, it's funny because my when I've communicated with film labs or just anybody that shoots film regularly, I have to explain to them despite the photos that I take coming out really great. I have to go, I have no idea what I'm doing. I really do not, like the film emulsion process and development process does not really translate in my brain because I haven't put my hands on it. Like I have a, a digital file. So there's there's a piece of the workflow and process that like, it's like if I were to shoot something and then someone else called it and then I got it back, I wouldn't learn from my mistakes. And so similarly, I shoot stuff. I don't do a great job of meticulous like note taking about it. And so I get stuff back. I'm like, what did I shoot this on? What was happening here? And it's it's hard to learn on it having not done it. So I'm it's actually quite the the thorn in my side of like trying to learn how to be better at a thing that I'm already kind of just go get a print like do the printing thing because also the printing too like like that's a whole like I was trying to tell my husband I'm like these are stuff that I physically printed like it's not just like a printer shot it out like I made it and like burning and dodging and then burning and dodging it's like 
I feel like once you actually burn and dodge in a light in a dark room, then you can actually burn and dodge in Lightroom or in Photoshop, and then you know what you're actually doing. Yeah, there's a yeah, there's so. a different translation there for sure. I've always gone the route of like, well, I'm already trial and erroring this part. I don't know if I want to trial and error the rest. So I go, I'll let I'll let somebody do this, and I'll let somebody do the printing, and then I'll just figure out the actual shooting of it. But now I just recently got my first medium format camera, and so it was neat to like, uh, yeah, yeah, the RZ67. And so it's been really cool. It's so heavy and I'm trying to treat it like a street photographer's camera. And it's been really neat to like shoot a few rolls on it and send those in quickly with haste and get them back really fast. Go, okay, I now rem- I, I still have a memory of like what the room looked like, what the settings were at, what I shot it at, what I was thinking to try to like bridge that gap. Because I still have so many rolls of film that are just like they land in a baggie and then they don't get sent off. And then I don't see what they are for like six months. And by that point, I'm like, I don't remember what I was thinking when I shot this. I can't learn that way. Totally. Totally. I mean, that's an organization yeah. thing too. As yeah. Well, right? I just, just learned how to organize my negatives and requested them back from my archivist. So they're like, I actually have all my own negatives organized by like date and time film stock. And that that's a new thing too, for somebody who's super data organized. I'm only now recently physical yeah. medium organized. Yeah. And I mean, for the, I have a Mamiya RZ672, but it's like broken now because an ex-boyfriend bought it for me and I think it was like a bungle that, you know, whatever. But I did have a d- digital back at one point for it too, which is cool. Like you can shoot both then too, um, which is interesting. So I think, you know, there's just a lot of avenues. Yeah. Of it's really neat. It really like when people say, oh, film slows you down. I don't think film slows me down. Shooting an RZ67 slows me down though. <laughs> like that's like, I can preload three rolls, but in the middle of a, oh, so in the middle of a shoot to go, uh, actually, hang on. It's, uh, we all need to take a seat for a minute. I'm going to need to reload film. It's, it's going to be a minute. Why don't you grab a sandwich? <laughs> yeah. Well, and also just looking down and then like how it's not, it's like counterintuitive. Yeah, it, it, is, it is very, yeah, it's counterintuitive, but yeah, it's been, it's been a cool experience. I'm really excited because you've talked to me years ago about like, why aren't, why am I not doing more? with the portrait work that I shoot. And like, I have had friends now who have shown me that, oh, my work can be an art form that then people will buy the art rather than like somebody hires me and then I shoot photos. And so learning that and trying to tiptoe into that at some point is hopefully the next step. But the RZ is, I I don't want to walk away from shoots with 80 to 150 images delivered. I want to walk away from shoots with like five images delivered. And I think this will help me kind of get to that point. I love it. I think it's a great thing to do. And then, you know, just... Like, like I said, it's, it's just a total art form. And then, then you can add those to Etsy and, but also setting up your Etsy shot is a shop is yeah. like a complete pain in the ass as well. Whole, but, yeah. Whole nother thing. Oh my gosh. Yeah. But no, I'm sure. And, you do um, and what's your problem? What are you working on right now? What's like, what's your issue? Me figuring out how to be a director of photography. That's my current issue. <laughs> yeah. So have you done, so walk me through that. Like, so what's your, what do you know that your role is going to be for, for, I, I'm a layman just like the audience here. I don't know really yeah. anything what a director of photography's actual job responsibilities and follow through looks like from a, a creative and tangible logistics standpoint. I really didn't even know either. Someone just picked me because they were like, I love your vision. Like, this is love why. It. And I was like, and it wasn't like assistant DB. It's like you're the director. And it's, it's like a whole thing. But it's uh, something where like every shot, like, yeah, the, the director itself actually mostly works with like the actors. But the DP is like, they're like everything that you see in frame, like, oh, hey, we need to add lighting there, like how it's actually shot and how the composition is all the director of photography. Because if you think about it, a movie is just a bunch of photos, you know, it's just so that's like what it is. So I'm really trying to learn everything I can about it, but also remember to just approach it like I want this to be just like a movie of my photography and like, like Roma or something like that. You know, when like films that have inspired me, because I don't know about you, but a lot of my inspiration comes from music videos and film. Um, yeah, same. You know, like Dark Knight is one of my favorite shot films, you know, La La Land, like all these things are basically I'm now about to watch these all on silent and just really take them in. And so, yeah, that's mine like a is, whole, yeah, mine is any movie that I can pause and it looks like a painting or a, a beautiful image that like the one that really sticks out that was like really surprised me was the second Suicide Squad movie. I didn't expect it. I watched it and I was like, oh my gosh, this movie is gorgeous. It's shot. Every frame in it is so stunning. And now there's movies that I'll watch that like I saw Past Lives recently, which the movie's great. The story's fine. Uh, but the frames within it are just so beautiful. And I could tell it was shot on film. And I go, oh, yeah, this is the way the highlights are exposing the background. This is totally film. This is a beautiful shot. Like, I would be happy if this was just a photo. Um, so on a day like that where you're saying, okay, we walked into a room. 
or setting ambient lights and naturals or whatever it may be. Um, are you the person that's actually, because it's a larger production, I've never been on a production set before. Are you the person actually grabbing lights and setting things up? And, or are you just saying, hey, Bob, that's what I want. Make it happen. Yeah, that's what the coolest thing about it is. Like, they're hiring a cameraman for me, and they, they told me they want me to specifically, like, they're giving me a rig where if I just want to take it, I can uh, go ahead and handhold it at some point. Um, just to, knowing me, that's, I'm just, knowing you, that's probably yeah, what yeah. at some point. Be like, let me just get in there. I just want to drive this shit. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Yeah. But um, yeah, so like they're hiring a cameraman for me. They're hiring a, a gaffer. That's what it's called is somebody that's doing lighting. Um, so somebody for gaffing. And then ideally, like would love someone to dump the cards. That's not me, but I might end up doing that. So yeah. Yeah, that's amazing. That's so cool. I, you know, I, I've heard stories from you about like production sets. And there's another photographer who has been on the podcast before. And he lives in New Zealand. His name is Sai. And he has just kind of like, talk to me about like a 20 person set and the relationships that are built within it and how you end up getting other work beyond that. And it's this, um, I haven't talked about it on the podcast, but I'm debating right now moving to New York. It's like in the cards of possibilities of in October of doing that for the purpose of, you know, that's, I, I don't know the next steps in the next lane of what I want to do, but I know enough people out there with arm's length reach to be like, you know what, put me, put me on a production set. Let me see what's going on here. Like, could I be, is this a role, a new creative lane? Because the, the wedding space, is pretty limited. It's a pretty narrow, narrow pipeline for it. And also if I just want to make photos that are cool and sell them as art, that's really neat too. But what can it look like for like a nine to five job that still allows me to be creative, but doesn't stifle me into, you know, sitting in front of a computer and just doing emails or teams chats or something. Yeah. And I can tell that like, obviously you love doing video or uh, weddings, but I can tell that you're like wanting a little bit more. I can like yeah, tip of your yeah. tongue, you know? Um, but I always tell people like move to New York, just move to New York. And it doesn't mean you can move there for a month. You can move there for three months. You can move there for five years and don't feel like a failure if that chapter has to end. But like, it is a hundred percent a dream to live in New York city and it is no place more inspiring. I always tell my husband, like the loves of my life, like first were New York, then my photography and then him like in that order, you know what I mean? Uh, just because like New York is like it's everything, right? It's so amazing. Yeah, I, like, I love like, I I love Chicago, but the fact is, like, I can walk. There's I can walk blocks and see nothing that I care to take a photo of. Whereas I can't walk ten feet in New York without being saturated by something. That I go, oh my gosh, that would be that would be a great street photo. That would be a great spot to photograph a person or a model or a shoot or something like that. Like, I just think there's no better thing that you can do for yourself than to immerse it and at least try it. And like I said, if it doesn't work out, just don't be afraid to come back and don't be like, oh my God, I failed in New York or oh my God, I'm embarrassed. Like I, I've had so many seasons and reasons and chapters and all that stuff that, like I said, I lived in Staten Island for three years in my New York and it just happened to be how I could survive, you know? Like I wasn't making enough money to live in Manhattan. Um, yeah, you've you know, been really maybe, good at that. Yeah. You, you've you've changed and relocated and and pivoted your business or pivoted your creativity so many times. And I'm actually just, I'm just a nervous little, <laughs> little wuss about it. And I've done the move to Seattle and I moved, did the move to Chicago. But um, the idea of like, now it's actually, life is actually really prepared. Like I actually have my finger on the pulse of my budget and everything. And so now it's, it's less of a, oh God, can I make it financially? Oh God, is this like what I want to do? Will it meet my social, my social uh, things that I want to do and things like that. But yeah, just learning that next you know, there's so many pieces of this industry that I'm a really knowledgeable, proficient person in one really specific lane. And I've avoided other pieces of it. Like, I would love to shoot video. I think it'd be really cool. But I'm not really interested in the gear and the memory storage and the batteries and learning it all and learning it all from square one. Because unless it comes out looking like a Christopher Nolan movie, I'm going to be upset about it because I want it to be the quality that my photos are. And so it's hard to start it's hard to start new areas in a creative field when you're already like pretty established in one. Hey, maybe you'll end up just being a director too, like a DP, because it's like, that's where like, I, I mean, I don't know a single thing about film, like how to have a video yeah. cameras. Like, I don't know anything about it, but like God took me this direction. Right. So I just think like, if you, have faith in yourself and have faith in whatever, like it could be universe or whatever, like just know that something's always got your back. And like, I just think, um, where am I trying to say this? I just, you can do anything in this world. You just have to believe in yourself and you really have to not give a shit what people think of you. Like that's also yeah. bottom line. Like, like I said, move to New York. Don't give a shit. If people think like, Oh, he thinks he's too cool for Chicago. Move to New York, move back to Chicago and don't care. Oh, he's back in Chicago. Like you have to really not care what people think um, and just do what's best for you. 
I completely agree. I am not good at participating in that action, but I completely agree about it for sure. I hope that like we have another podcast episode in like five years from now and we're both like DPs doing something totally different. We're like, <laughs> remember that one time when we were on that podcast? <laughs> Well, I think like ele- like changing and growing and like, I think photographers and, um, you know, everybody just likes to stay very like narrow, fine. Like, this is what I'm going to do. And if you're not adaptable and you're, if you don't like believe in modernity, like to me, I would never be making FaceTime shoots. Like I've made thousands upon thousands of dollars on FaceTime shoots, which isn't like, yeah, maybe it's not my favorite thing to do every day, but like I'm doing it for my family. I'm doing it so I can do other passion projects, you know? Yeah. So um, I, just I think, think it's picking, I, I think it's picking and choosing and being variety. So like I started shooting seniors and families and weddings. And then I noticed, okay, what I want to be is a wedding photographer and all the wedding photographers I'm looking up to, all they do is photograph weddings. So let's carve out these other two things and focus on this for a while. And now it's like, okay, I'm not, I mean, I'm not going to go shoot a high school senior session anytime soon, but there's other lanes of this, the guard. Let's start learning. And, and it, this business is, have you found times in your business where you almost have to conscientiously seek out learning a new thing within your own creative, like you, cause you can be kind of complacent or are you someone who like, you're always like trying to eat up new stuff? always trying to eat up new stuff for sure um and like just nothing's beneath me you know what i mean like if i need money i'm gonna do whatever the opportunity is like i'm very like my humbleness is very grounded um like i'm just not like i just because i always think you never know where something could lead like i've shot somebody's senior portraits and then it happened to be like literally there's this girl i did her senior pictures for and then her mom as we're walking out she's like do you photograph like sports? And I was like sitting here thinking, I'm like, no, I don't really want to do like high school sports. Turns out she's friends with the GM for the Suns. You know what I mean? Like, and now she's recommending me to like every single person she knows. And maybe one day I'll shoot the yeah. Suns. You know? And that's not to say thinking- that I won't shoot. Like if I needed to make the bills for sure, like I'm going to do it. I'm at a place now where thankfully like photography doesn't need to be the thing that always pays rent. But when it is like, yeah. I will accept any kind of work. It's just what I might publicize or build a business around. And so like, I don't want to suddenly next month be like chasing down high school seniors and family photos and all that stuff. But if I needed to like, if it's presented itself, I've shot some like, Hey, we have a thousand dollars to shoot this Mormon wedding in Washington. And it happened to be the same weekend. I was planning a personal trip. Sweet. You just paid for my flights. Awesome. I'll shoot your quick little like thing for a G and then I'm going to enjoy my trip. And now it feels free. Like stuff like that. I'll always like always take (laughs) I always think it's good to be flexible too. Like, you know, just like, you know, even like with just certain things, like people have budgets for stuff and they really can't like sway from it. But like, that's why I always tell people, I'm like, Hey, here's my rates. Here's what I charge. And like, maybe your rate, your budget is half. Like I'm fine with adjusting for that or like whatever, because if it suits my need and I have a budget goal or I have a monthly like income goal and it's going to meet that, then I'm like down to do it, you know? And not saying you should always like lower your standards or anything like that, but I just think sometimes um, to do this full time, it takes a little swing. Yeah, and I think the camera just opens doorways a lot. Like I have a tennis instructor that I'm like communicating with who I did a quick photo shoot for her and her girlfriend. What's that? An hour of my time, another hour of editing or something. And now I've got like 10 free lessons built in because I did a quick thing that cost me two hours of my life. And so, yeah, I'll take that. Or if someone reaches out with a lower budget shoot in, a place that I already wanted to go to or planning on going to, well, maybe normally I would have said no, but well, this works out. Sure. I'll let my camera like open that doorway and lead me to the next thing for sure. Exchanges are like key. I haven't paid for Botox in like four years. I don't, (laughs) I don't do nothing. I like, even just with anybody, I'm like, Hey, you want to do an exchange? Hey, you want to do an exchange? Like if it doesn't work for you, like I'm all about it. We love a tax free situation. We love a, you know, and just things that benefit me, like, yeah, you know. Hundred percent. Um, Sometimes I feel like I'm, I'm not taking advantage, but I go, really? Like, you're going to, you're going to do 10 hours of your tennis in the time for the two hours I took to shoot this thing? I guess, I, I guess that works out. <laughs> and I don't fight it. I'll, I'll accept it happily. Well, and that's, you know, like we said, managing our budgets and keeping our costs low, you know, like, pff. Yeah, I just shop for a dispensary. I got credits there. You know, what I, mean? I just like I don't pay for stupid stuff what's, anymore. What's because the? I uh, this will be the last thing I ask you. What's the silliest exchange thing you've done? Um, I mean, I wouldn't take like anything, but like, I mean, I'm just about to do some photos for some matcha protein powder because like that's pretty silly. That's pretty good. 
pretty silly, but I'm like, I want, I like matcha. So yeah. I'm, I'm a vegetarian. So and I want it and I don't want to pay $60 a bag for it. So I just, I say that's a pretty good deal. I remember I didn't accept this deal, but a partner in my studio did, uh, wh whom you had met in the past. And he did some exchange where we got like $600 in gift cards to a donut place in Rockford. <laughs> And I don't recall getting, and I think those gift cards just like disappeared as the studio dissolved. And I thought about it like a year later. I was like, where are those like gift cards? I want some donuts. It's like $600 in trade donuts. And it was the silliest exchange that I didn't get to reap the benefits That's of. That's pretty silly, yeah. But so like Matt, you know, you just for our studio, it was such a silly and like right on par with everything. But that's the thing is like, even anything, like if there's like a business I like here, like I'll be like, hey, do you want to do an exchange? Like, let's just do it because I'm already going to pay for it. And like, how can, and the thing is like, you built up your Instagram following, you built up this, like a lot of times people are like, oh, heck yeah, like, that'd be great, you know? So I just think, yeah, that's like a really key thing. Like if anyone's like trying to be a photographer, don't be afraid of exchanges. Yeah, especially smaller. Like if I find something that's like less than a couple thousand followers and they make a product for like a really, a really niche thing. This is made by a couple photographers, but this is a pen by a brand called Studio Neat. And I, I didn't do anything with them, but I reached out. I was like, man, I'd love to take some photos of your pens because I want one because it makes a really good clicky sound. And it didn't work out, but like there's another half dozen where it did work out in that way. And it's like, cool, awesome. I'll, I wanted to buy this anyways. I'm going to buy it regardless. If they want to give it to me for free and I'll take photos, that's fine too. Well, also just, I think like another, like just, you know, obviously because photographers listen to this podcast, but like, I'm very determined when it comes to like who I want to work with too. Like, I don't know. Do you know Joey Valance and Bray? I don't like, think so. They're basically like the new Beastie Boys and I'm like, they are going to be like popping and I'm obsessed with them. And like, I, I straight up harassed them on Instagram. I was like, let me photograph you. Like, I want to do it. And then their team ended up emailing me back and like, it's not going to work out. Like, I'm so bummed about it because just their schedule when they're in town, but it's like, still like, I got them to email me back. I got them to DM me back because I was so determined, you know, and maybe it'll work out in the future. But I just think like, if there's anything you want to do, just like, don't expect it to fall in your lap. Like, you know, I'm a very established photographer and I still am like blowing up these like guys on YouTube who I just think are like fabulous and super talented because yeah. I want to work with them. We, we just I'll get them to work with me. We just posted a blog about it recently about uh, reaching out for educate or like editorials and publications. And, you know, the, well, the one thing that I really reference often is I, I was really fortunate enough to get to write an article for Rangefinder and have the cover of it uh, a couple of years ago. And it's something I really wanted. I, I really wanted that specifically. And it didn't just come through in an email. Like I had to email that editor and find the person and find them on LinkedIn and find their personal email and kind of stalk editors of various wedding blogs and things until I was like, Hey, we're going to be friends. Um, here, like just start showing my photos. Cause I don't want to go through the 400 submissions a month channel that they've already got. And I think a lot of people assume that they just open an email one day and they're like, you got a wedding feature, blah, blah, blah. Which actually as a side note, while we're recording, I know that you emailed me something about your wedding as a wedding feature. And I need to get back to it. <laughs> but like, sometimes the email does come in, but one out of every 10, the other nine, you've got to just oh, be yeah. calling and emailing and, and messaging. And just be determined. Like, I mean, and then also Instagram is such an insane resource. Like even this girl from Selling Sunlets, I'm like, I'm determined to photograph her too. And I just, every photo she posts, I'm like, we should do a photo shoot. She just liked the comment. I was like, I'm gonna get her. I'm gonna get her. <laughs> oh yeah, that's amazing. So, uh, well, thank yeah. you so much for taking the time to do this. It's so good to like finally catch up. It's been a minute since, I really haven't chatted with you since your wedding. And we've been trying to do this a couple times. And I think you, you had a surgery or something, right? I did. Yeah, yeah. Did. I've had three ankle surgeries. I'm so, so glad this is like finally happened. And man, it's just been so great. And I really appreciate you for your time. I think you are so talented. And like, I, I wish I could have hung out with you more at my wedding. Like, I just think you're so fabulous. And thank you for the incredible job you did for me and my husband. Like, we are oh so Oh my gosh, thank you for trusting me. It was so great. It was like, what a get to hang out with friends that I know. Like, friend weddings are the best weddings. Because I just know who you are. You know who I am. I don't have to like pretend to be anything. I don't have to explain much. It's like, we're on the same page. So. No, I appreciate it. And thank you for having me. I love chatting with you. Yeah, of course. Thanks so much, Katie.